name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now praise famous men and our fathers in their generations. Great quotation from Sirach 44.1, where he begins the praise of the great heroes of the faith that have gone before. Famous men and our fathers in their generations. I'm reminded as well of Tomaso Crehon in his book, The Island Man, who mourns the passing of, as he put it, the two, his parents, the two, which I think Robin Flower, the Gaelic scholar, uh, described as a, an almost Homeric phrase. And today, I suppose, I, I, I've talked about the priesthood and I've talked about the religious life, but none of these would be possible, really, if it weren't for another group in the church. And this group is enormous. So much so that Newman dryly remarked when one rather uh, impatient bishop asked him, what is the laity? Newman replied that the church would look very odd without them. And I'm reminded again of Melville, uh, Herman Melville, in, in, in his classic work, uh, Moby Dick, great work, American literature, who addresses what he calls thou great democratic God, thou who in all thy mighty earthly marchings ever cullest thy selectest champions from the kingly commoners. Bear me out in it, O God. The kingly commoners. And so today I want to talk about about this group, if you can call them that, because they are the church. And the priesthood, which is also the church and constituent of the church, it exists to serve this group, as teachers exist to teach their students. It has been raised up to serve this group. The prophets were called to bring God's news to the people. Oh, Sirach uh, elsewhere said the prophet Elijah rose like a fire. These are the fires that God sets to warm his people. He sets these fires to give light and warmth to his people. The kingly commoners. Commoners because they're the main part of the church. The foot soldiers, the ordinary Catholics. But that, those designations are pointless and insolent. Kingly, because they are anointed at their baptism as Christ was anointed priest, prophet and king. And they hold the priesthood of all the believers. And so these, these people who are mistakenly called the ordinary church members are every one of them extraordinary and kingly, a royal people. And this is the matrix of the priesthood, the episcopate, the religious, the saints, the theologians, the great artists, the great scientists, the laity, the lay men and women of the church, the Catholics for whom the priesthood exists and without whom the priesthood would look very strange indeed. It is on their behalf that the priest offers gift and sacrifice. It is for them that he trudges the roads to bring the sacraments. It is for them that he really exists because priesthood changes the very core of the person. So how were they brought into it? How do they start their game? Because I was ordained and religious are professed and then if some of them become priests, they're ordained. So how do the laity start? The laity start with baptism. There's a very good film about the origins of the CIA called The Good Shepherd. It's a good film. I'm not sure how entirely accurate it is because it very much indicates that the CIA had its origin very much in the WASP so-called WASP society in America, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, whereas my understanding always is that was more true of the FBI and the CIA were, was actually uh, rather more dominated by Catholics, like uh, one of its founders, James Jesus Angleton, who sounds pretty formidable. But be, be that as it may, at one stage, he's on behalf of the CIA. Uh, Matt Damon is playing this long-serving CIA operative from a classic WASP background. They've come to a deal with the Mafia. They're trying to 
fend off the Russian spies. I think it's with regard to Cuba. And Joe Pesci plays the Mafia boss, as always very well. And as they're musing after they've finished the business, Pesci says to him, you know, he says, I can't figure people like you out. Us Italians, you know, he said, we've got Italy and we've got the church. He said, the Irish have got the old country. Poles have got their thing and so on. But he said, he said, you lot, he said, what do you have? And Damon puts down his coffee cup and he says, we've got America and the rest of you are just passing through. I thought that was a great answer. It was calculated to infuriate. I thought it was a very good answer. And I'm talking really about the group in the church who are absolutely constitutive, in, indispensable and core, which is the laity. None of us would be here without them. All of us began as lay people. I'm a priest, but I was a lay person before. I, be, I was a lay person for a long time. I, was, I wasn't ordained until I was 29. Lay people gave me my faith. They gave me my vocation. I quoted O'Crehon. O'Crehon praised the two who had put the Irish language into his ears for the first time. I praise the two who put the faith into my ears for the first time. I praise the old two, my grandparents, who helped enormously with that. The laity are absolutely fundamental in the church. And it's absolutely crucial that many of you listening to me realise the grandeur of your vocation if you are a lay Catholic. Don't allow yourself to become restless thinking, well, if I have faith and my faith is this strong, I should be a religious or I should be a priest. You should be a religious if God wants you to be a religious. You should be a priest if God wants you to be a priest. Otherwise, you should continue being a Catholic doing what you're doing. And you do something else because you believe he wants you to do something else. And you've prudently gone about trying to ascertain what he wants. But be careful of... I think if you were to identify real clericalism, and I'm sorry to say that sometimes what's called clericalism nowadays is a perfectly justifiable and proper and healthy and virtuous pride in the priesthood, in its beauty and its traditions and everything else. And it's very wrong to try to kill that in a young fellow who's studying for the priesthood. That's not clericalism. But I think a sure mark of clericalism is contempt for the laity. If you see a priest who has that, that priest has lost his way. He's a priest, but my God, he's a distortion. He's like a grotesque gargoyle of the priesthood. And none of us are too pretty to look at. But that's, that's gone mad altogether. But don't you see it in restaurants? I mean, you do. Come on. In fairness, I like to eat. Okay, I like to eat. I like, I, I like feeding my fat face. Okay, I love to eat. I'm a good Catholic. I love the table. My two feet are hanging out of the fridge constantly in the house. I like to eat. And I like to eat out. I love all that. I came from a very remote village and I love that whole sort of urban thing of eating out. I don't, I don't actually, I can't afford to eat out in really expensive restaurants and I don't need to. But I like to eat out in a nice restaurant. I love Italian food because I was trained out there and I absolutely adore Italian food. Every so often you go to a restaurant where you're made uncomfortable and treated like dirt by the waiter. Because the restaurant is a good restaurant and this Lachico has got the notion into his head that because he's working in a good restaurant, he gets to treat the customers as if they were peasants, which probably a few of us are, but we don't need to be reminded of it by him. And he totally forgets that a really top-class waiter, a good waiter, his whole craft is towards putting people at their ease. He is a gentleman or a lady, or she is a lady, who is waiting on other gentlemen and ladies at table, making their evening beautiful. It's the most spiritual and Christian vocation. It's a beautiful thing to do to wait on table. And it's tremendously hard work and it's very skilled. It's not everyone can do it. But it's not a warrant to simply treating people badly because you're in bad form or looking down on them because you're working in an expensive restaurant and you sense instinctively that maybe the people you're dealing with aren't wealthy and, and they saved up to go there for that evening. But you do see it, and you see this, uh, the same thing in the priesthood, and you may think it's a strange comparison, but it's not a strange comparison. Because the, pre the most beautiful thing at the core of the priesthood is service. Now sometimes serving means that you have to say to your, your parishioners, you're wrong. And they may think you're very arrogant for saying it, but woe to you if you do not preach the gospel, you may have to say that. But you always say it with respect. 
You may lose the cool. I've done it. You may be bad-tempered and have to apologise. I've been bad-tempered and I've had to apologise and I have apologised. That relationship is human and you're going to make mistakes, but the core of your, your drift must be service. And why am I going on about the priesthood when I should be talking about the laity? It is because in the hierarchic constitution of the church, you can't understand. And St. Paul makes this point in Corinthians. So this state that is called the laity, which we serve, which is the salvation of whom is, is the raison d'etre of the priesthood. Yeah? It's the raison d'etre of the priesthood. This is, is a proper topic for lengthy examination. We, we should talk about this off and on over several sessions. Now, I'd just like to make the point here. How do you come into this? How do you come into this remarkable vocation of being an allegedly ordinary Catholic? You come into this not through vows, not through ordination, not through consecration. You come into this through baptism. It is baptism which is completed by the other sacraments of initiation, by confirmation and the Holy Eucharist. It's baptism that brings you into this state. Baptism makes all this begin. Baptism starts the whole thing. The absolutely crucial thing in being a Catholic is that you take ownership of your faith. My grandfather, who was a great example to me when I was a boy, he was a tough man. He'd been a soldier like a lot of his generation in the First World War. He was a tough man. Well, he was in the American Army, so he didn't serve all that long because they weren't in it all that long, but he was in it. And he has sort of an army mentality all his life. He spent the rest of his life as a small farmer in the west of Ireland. He had a deep faith like a lot of the men of his generation. We've lost a male piety. If you want male piety now, you'd have to look at some of the Protestants and the Muslims. But I'm afraid Catholics have lost it. And I'm not in any way being uh, misogynistic or anything when I say that it's, it's become a very feminine piety, which is a magnificent thing, but it is not male. Yet that's a loss to the church, is that magnificent variety, that's that tropical luxuriance that the God had conferred on the church. If you swore in front of him, he'd swear as good as you any day, my grandfather. But if you took the holy name in vain, he would take his cap off and he would stand staring at you until you stopped. And then he put his cap back on when you stopped. But he would take his cap off because you had mentioned the holy name. Now by crikey, you didn't do it twice. I have many memories of that kind growing up. I remember looking around in church at this, that and the other. And not my parents, who didn't see me, uh, but a neighbour tapped me on the shoulder. And when I looked around, he pointed like that at the altar. I didn't need to be told twice. These farmers... They were not people of many words. <laughs> yeah, I did. Neighbours would correct you. This was common in many communities in the past. These were these were people of real faith. The fact that they hadn't become priests didn't mean that they weren't devout Catholics. And let me tell you that just people think that Catholics in the past were subservient to the clergy. They were subservient to the clergy in certain things. They were very clear as to where the line was drawn. All hell could break loose if priests crossed that line. Now, I know priests did and got away with it sometimes, but they, sometimes they wouldn't get away with it. They owned their faith and they would have died for their faith. They couldn't get on with their neighbours and getting on with your neighbours far more difficult anyway. So I suppose what I'm saying is I grew up with people who had no more than a national school education, who revered the priesthood, but who in no way were lacking in confidence in the way in which they appropriated their faith. It was their faith. They made up their own prayers. They prayed away to themselves during the old Latin Mass. The women on the left and the men on the right, the women with their head scarves. I remember all that. I saw the tail end of it. I stayed with my grandmother on one side, well, you know, until I got a little bit older. And then I proudly went across and I sat with my grandfather. My parents went to a different Mass. They had a shop and they had to be there in the shop when everyone came out of that Mass. So it was, the family were organised around that. And I saw that further down and further down. And I, th I think it's actually still going on. Is huge input from grandparents. The faith of the laity is the matrix of the church and of everything else. It is from the laity that everything rises. That is why the Holy Father, it's not because he's trying to down the priests all the time. Although being a Jesuit and, and Jesuit teachers, they love to give you a kick because they feel you need humility. He's constantly giving the, the priesthood a good walloping. But he's constantly taking us 
and he's literally taking us by the scruff of the neck, turning us around and pointing us towards what we're supposed to be at. Do you remember when he said, you know, a good priest has the smell of the sheep off him? That's, that's not denigrating the laity. That's, what he's saying there is that a priest who's clinically, totally, antiseptically free of all tinge of the laity couldn't possibly be doing his work. In some way, your own people will, will, will influence you. They have to, because you're with them all the time. That's quite proper. Now, I know the Irish clergy traditionally might have taken it a bit far and they were notorious for go betting on horses and going to races and coursing and hunting and you name it and all that and stuff that really priests weren't supposed to be doing. But they were in country parishes mixing constantly with farmers and they often came from farming stock themselves. And on an, looked at another way, it was a beautiful thing that they had. They were mad for sport. And, and that was in itself a beautiful thing. And so Pope Francis is constantly telling us that the priest, he should be wearing his flock in the same way as um, a young father or mother going to work with the remains of baby sick on their nice shirt or whatever. That's a badge of honour. All right, I don't know, the boss might view it differently, but that is a badge of honour. What else is the baby going to get sick on? That's for sure far for the baby to get sick on. <laughs> And in the same way, I fall down on this. Look, there, there are a whole lot of implications to this. You can't talk about the laity without the priesthood. You can't talk about the priesthood without the laity. It goes on, so you, you end up veering back and forward. The laity is crucial. It is absolutely crucial. And what is the vocation of the laity? You're going to say now, well, that's real clericalism. You're making us sound like kids. We should all be like kids. We should all be childlike. Not childish. Childish is a caricature of, of the state of the child, of childhood. That's like effeminate to feminine. Effeminacy is irritating. Femininity is beautiful. In the same way, childishness is, is annoying. But we should all be childlike. Have a simplicity, a trust in God, a love for God. And so, what is the vocation of the lady? The old catechism put it perfectly. We are here to know, love and serve God in this life and to be with him forever in the next. You're going to be with God for eternity. This life isn't very long. It really would be a good idea to get to know him. It would also be a good idea to learn to talk to him because otherwise the silences will be very tedious later. So it's as well to start now. And the priest serves the laity in this magnificent apprenticeship. So if the priest is not a man of prayer, you're buggered. You're done, right? Forgive the parade ground language, but I, 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 this is too important. I mean, you really are in trouble. Now, I'm saying that as a priest who isn't holy. OK, so I know all too well. I think it was a great spiritual writer and not at all fashionable now, but if you ever come across his book, very dated in some ways, but ah, it's still pure gold in it. Chotard. Can't remember his first name. C-H-A-U-T-A-R-D. Chotard. He was a famous Trappist abbot in France. Famous for taking on Tiger Clemenceau uh, over the anti-clerical legislation of his government. Thomas Merton writes about him. And Shotar has a book called The Soul of the Apostle. And in that book, he says famously, he said, if the priest is a saint, his people will be holy. If the priest is holy, his people will be good. If the priest is good, his people will be all right. <laughs> and if the priest is all right, the parish is bad jexed. Now, this is a topic we're going to get into in the next talk, which is about leadership, which is a major issue in discussing the laity. So what have the laity a right to? The laity have a right to the service of a good priest, at the very least. Now, I'm not even talking about religious here, because the contribution of religious to the laity is huge. But the religious are not priests. Remember that, they're not clerics, unless they are. Some of them are, but they don't have to be. So the laity have the right to be served at table. The laity have the right to be treated with respect in this restaurant. The laity have the right to be shown hospitality and put at their ease. They have the right to leadership of the first order. And if they don't get it, this is no reflection on them. And why? Because the laity have to run the world. That's their job. It is to sanctify the temporal order. That's their job. To achieve the social reign of our Lord Jesus Christ in the world. That's their job. And that is enough to be getting on with without having to do the parish priest work for him as well. So this thing of priests going on, oh, the laity are going to have to lead more, the laity are going to have to do this, that and the other more in the church. I can see where they're coming from, but like the priests are the leaders in the church. That's what they're supposed to be at. We're supposed to give that service because the laity have to lead the world. They have to get on with it. And remember this, the laity have to show spiritual leadership in the world. 
That doesn't mean the priest doesn't show spiritual leadership out in the world. But he's not out in the world all the time. He has to run his parish. He has to look after his faithful. He, he looks for the lost sheep, but he has to mind the flock as well. Our Lord said, leave the flock behind you and look for the lost sheep. He didn't say, give the wolves the address of the flock. You have to mind both. To know, love and serve God in this life and be with him forever in the next. Let's say that with the respect it deserves. That is an eternal project. Just read what, what Paul has to say in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 and 14 about all the gifts, the gifts of prophecy. You remember all those gifts? The gifts he lists off, the gifts of prophecy. He clearly intends those for the laity. It's not just for the priests. Those are for the laity. Everyone is called. It is quite clear from reading Paul in 1 Corinthians that everyone is called to sanctity and to the apostolate. So the laity, this is crucial now. Do you remember I mentioned von Balthasar in our last talk at the Christian State of Life? I'll go back to that book again, where von Balthasar makes the points crucial. Is the laity is not, 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 did I say not? A passive state. It's not a dead weight to be lifted by the priest. And an active laity is not to be feared by the priest, unless they're a pack of heretics, in which case it's probably at least half the fault of the priest anyway. Sorry, but it probably is. Not again because the laity are stupid. Jeepers, most of them are better educated than we are now. But more because they have such busy lives. The priest is supposed to be doing, he's, he's supposed to have their back. He's supposed to have their back covered like he's to be there for them. Everyone is called to sanctity. Everyone is called to the apostolate. And this is absolutely crucial to understand. And Vatican II, in the, the Apostolic Constitution, uh, Apostolic Actuositatum, the Constitution on the Laity, 1965. Vatican II made that crystal clear. The temporal order was to be sanctified. No, they weren't. Vatican II wasn't the first council to say that. Uh, that had been said before. It was to be sanctified and it was to be sanctified by a, a, an educated, theologically literate laity who knew what they were about, in which they were to be served through leadership by the priests. The priests to lead in the church, but the laity would go, were to sanctify the world. I said about the priest, and I'm saying it about the laity, is if you try to do this perfectly, you'll never start. Grace perfects nature. Every single day you have to ask yourself to be worthy of your baptism. Every single day. Now here I'm going to say something to you as a lay person, okay? And some people aren't going to like this. But I love saying things like that because they make me sound so tough. For goodness sake, will you make your mind up? I've talked about this before. Will you make a decision? Human beings are decision-making animals. We're rational animals. The faith is not, 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 not. Did I say not? I'll say it again, not. The faith is not irrational. That's heretical. We are rational animals. We have the most intellectual of all the religions that I'm aware of. Make decisions. If you don't believe, go. Now, it's an awful thing to say, and the Holy Father will probably kick me all the way around the room for saying something like that, but fair enough, I'll take my kicking. Maybe I deserve it for other things. For goodness sake, the longer you stay in when you're not in, you'll fester and poison everything around you and you'll destroy your own interior life. If you don't believe, if you actually believe the church is evil and it's bad, you must make a decision. You must make a decision. I believe you're tragically mistaken, but I can see how you would be mistaken. With respect, I'm not patronising. Because by crikey, we haven't made it easy for you. That's the best I can say. I'm speaking as a priest. We've let you down. And I can totally understand that. But there may be other reasons too. The incredible sophistication of an unprecedented civilization, Without any precedent in history. The level of technological sophistication and the social changes it, it has engendered. There is a whole load of stuff going on here. I think it's, it's probably it's tragic that at a time when leadership was absolutely crucial, leadership from the clergy was absolutely crucial, at a time we dropped the ball. The scandals came at a time when the temptation to chuck in Christianity, Catholicism, was unprecedentedly strong across the developed world. Now you're going to say to me, what a, what a thing to say, what an evil thing to say, to tell somebody to leave the church. I'm not telling you to leave the church. I don't want you to leave the church. I'm telling you, you might have to leave the church. And I'm appalled at that. But I'm appalled at lots of things in life. Life is full of tragedy, it's full of suffering and sadness and if priests, if those in charge of spiritual leadership, if they're going to have to change their trousers every time the dragon comes down the road breathing fire on this, this lonely and frightening road that is the path of faith, then we really are lost. Okay, so I'm looking straight at the dragon as best I can. I'm telling you that you may have to do the unthinkable. 
and you may have to go. And somehow, I think if somebody behaves with integrity, now you could take the advice that was traditionally given in the church. It's excellent advice. The advice uh, Blaise Pascal gives to his friend, I think. You know, take holy water, he said, pray, do all the things you always did. The faith will come back. These things happen. But I mean, if it pleases God not to, if, if, if it's not coming back, or it, look, you're going to have to make a decision. And you can't be sending your children to Catholic schools to be taught if you don't believe. You can't be at that. Why are you teaching in a Catholic school if you don't believe? Why are you having anything to do with the Catholic Church? If you had a job with a firm that was owned by the Mafia, would you feel easy about staying in that job? I mean, if you believe the Church is evil, can you possibly have anything to do with it? So, I mean, you have to ask that. The path of conscience is so lonely. It is the road on which God will find you. God will find you on that road of integrity and you'll make a hash of it. I've made a hash of it. We all make a hash of it. I am speaking to you and this is no false modesty. It's, I say it with great sadness. I'm speaking to you as a mediocre man, a small man, a man who has found himself repeatedly unworthy of the magnificent vocation he was given, first as a lay Catholic, then as a priest. God bless the mark as if I hadn't made enough of a hash of the first one. And I'm saying that to you, but I'm saying it to you because it must be said to you. You will only have one shot at this. It is central to the laity, especially in this age, is that you consider your position. You must place this as a human act, as the church teaches a human act is constituted. You must inform yourself. You must have sufficient information. You must have at least minimal freedom. You must have intention. You must have will. You must place a human act. You must make a decision to stay in the church. Or you have to somehow find your own way. And you must be very, very careful about transgressing your conscience later, having a Catholic funeral because you can't think of anything else to do for a relation of yours who doesn't believe, which is an absolute transgression on both sides, a transgression of their conscience and of the church's beliefs. For goodness sake, make decisions. And God bless you making that decision. I feel for you. I don't take any pleasure in saying this is a hard road. I know that road. And it's a tough road. So who says the lay Catholic is passive? The lay Catholic isn't passive. The lay Catholic is a warrior scarlet. The lay Catholic is a battler, a fighter. And all that's asked at the end of this is that you end up like an old alley cat with one ear missing and your ch tail chewed off, one eye gone, a few chunks of fur gone, but still, in, still with skin in the game, still going. You go down on your paws, fighting to the last. That's the spirit of the laity. You've been given the truth and you do not let go of it. You hang on to it for dear life. You fight for it like a cornered rat. Now, Vatican II's view of the laity had been anticipated. It had certainly been anticipated. And, and the people I'm going to read off, they are a spiritual instance of the American dictum I've quoted before that if you turn up to work, anything can happen. If you just make decisions, if you just get your hands dirty, anything can happen. Anything can happen. God will favour his adept. God will favour those who, who wish to learn their trade from. And that's true of the lay person and it's true of the priest. A lot of the Irish martyrs were lay people. Margaret Ball was a lay person. A lot of the Irish martyrs were lay. A lot of the English martyrs were lay people. A lot of them were very ordinary people. They were ordinary people who wouldn't give up their faith. It was because of people like this and apparently influenced by the, that story, but we'll come back to it again, Little, little Nelly of Holy God, the little girl down in Cork, in the, was it in the orphanage? who had this weird understanding of the Eucharist. This incredible faith in the Eucharist. A way beyond any piety that you might have to reproduce to please, please the nuns who were looking after her or whatever. And Pius X was absolutely, apparently fascinated by her. Apparently it was an influence on his reducing the age for reception of communion. And he encouraged the laity to receive communion more because they used, they'd, they'd receive about twice a year maybe. Now that, that has gone to pot altogether because people, I'm afraid, are often receiving communion who should not be receiving communion. If you're not going to Mass, you shouldn't be receiving communion. You go to a funeral, don't receive communion because you're in a state of sin. I, am I judging you? I'm not judging you. I'm frequently in a state of sin. I'm just telling you, you are too. Uh, so don't get cocky. Go to confession. Then go to communion. And if you can't, make an act of contrition, go to communion and get to confession as soon as you can afterwards. That's the way to deal with that. Have a bit of humility for God's sake. Get down off your high horse. Don't be so posh. Either you're up for this or you're not. It's not easy being a, being a Catholic. It's not easy. 
this lay Catholic priest, religious, this is not easy. And nobody gets off scot-free. It is active, it's proactive. It's not passive. But all you have to do is make a stab at it. Catherine Macaulay, wealthy young gentlewoman, sets up the Sisters of Mercy, which she intended to be a group of lay people doing good works. Nano Nagel, wealthy young gentlewoman, sets up the presentation, Sisters and Brothers, Again, intended a lay thing. Ignatius Rice, Edmund Ignatius Rice. Same thing with the Christian brothers. All lay movements. Frank Duff. Paul VI, he was a peritus, he was an expert of Vatican II, and Paul VI had great time for the Legion of Mary and Frank Duff. Frank Duff is a very, very significantly important man. And I, I would certainly say will be a saint. Very capable civil servant. Founded the Legion of Mary in his spare time. Look at this. These laity are running the church. This is incredible stuff. This is no merely passive lying back and afraid of the parish priest. And well, Duff was afraid, wasn't afraid of priests. He loved priests and revered priests, but he wasn't afraid of them. Duff got out there, and neither was Nan O'Nagel, and neither were Catherine Macaulay. They cheerfully battled with bishops. Matt Talbot, fantastic, almost certainly again going to be a saint. A layman. And then you have the ecclesial movements. Look at these modern phenomena. OK, well, it's, it's a modern version of an old phenomenon because before you were the third orders, the tertiaries, they were quite developed. Is it lay people who were following the rule of the Franciscan or Dominican or whatever, those, those orders or oblates of St. Benedict. The ecclesial movements and organisations, so the Legion of Mary is one, uh, Opus Dei is another. And interestingly, these movements are often products of huge turbulence. Opus Dei was born out of the tremendous anti-clericalism prior to the Spanish Civil War and then the cauldron of the Spanish Civil War itself. The Legion of Mary was founded just after the foundation of the Free State, the War of Independence and the horrors of the Civil War. Now just think about this. This is frontier stuff. These are all frontier movements and they're founded in huge turbulence. Uh, communion and Liberation, Comunione Liberazione, founded by Father Luigi Giussani in, Mil in Milan, was it the 50s or, or early 60s? Founded again in the, in the huge political turbulence that followed and uncertainty that followed the defeat of fascism and, and the Second World War in Italy, where the Communist Party could easily have taken over in Italy. What do we see? Neocatechumenate from Spain. Focolare, Chiara Lubic from uh, the, Italy again. Italian church is tremendously fecund. Focus in America for the English-speaking world. And I'm only naming a few. Jesus Youth among the Indians. The Indian Youth. I, I'm only skimming the surface here. These are all lay movements, although they contain priests. They are all lay movements. St. Jose Maria Escriva, as I understand it, had originally intended to found something, to, and he did too, he did it as a part of Opus Dei, to found something that would help priests. He was a diocesan priest. But he, he, he ended up doing something incredibly radical that prefigured the council. He had non-Catholics cooperating in his work before the council. And so Frank Duff prefigured the council. And the stuff the Legion of Mary were doing, I talked to two elderly women who, who were... <laughs> <laughs> they were doing legion work on the on the sidewalk in Dublin back in the 30s and were picked up by the guards because they thought they were on the game. <laughs> I mean, they had hilarious stories because, of course, they had gone into the toughest areas of the city where prostitution was rife. One of the greatest works the Legion of Mary did originally was with prostitutes. Dublin had a huge problem at the time. It was a huge red light district. A lot of these movements, I can't emphasise this too much because I think a lot of young lay Catholics are very discouraged. And I'm telling you that the most fertile periods for the development of the lay vocation have been in periods of tremendous strife and trouble. And I remind you again of the uh, tremendous words of Orson Welles. Uh, Graham Greene, who was convert to Catholicism, Graham Greene has a novel called The Third Man, set in Vienna, in the black market in Vienna. A very shady story um, after the war when Vienna is controlled by, is it about... A div three different powers. The Russians are there, the Americans are there, the English and French are there. Orson Welles plays this absolutely evil character, a very Catholic villain called Harry Lyme, who's a black marketeer selling dodgy drugs to the poor. An absolutely horrible character, but he's very charming and very interesting. And in an argument with the narrator of the film, with Holly, who's kind of the lens through which you see the film, Wells comes out with a comment that wasn't in the novel or in the script, he just thought it up. And it was so good they left it in the film. You know what the fellow said? 
In Italy, for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder and bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love. They had 500 years of democracy and peace. But what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. It's a famous, famous comment. I'm just saying, don't be afraid of the time we're in. And I'm saying this to all the... We'll go even more radical. I'm saying this to all the Catholics who are listening to me, to all of you, all of you trad cats, neo cats, medge heads, all of you different versions of the same thing, different tribal markings, Latin mass heads, you name it. Everyone, all Catholics. I'm saying to you, to paraphrase Dickens, it is the best of times, it is the worst of times. And it is the worst of times. It, it is catmologian, as we say in Ireland. And yet it is absolutely opportune. The opportunity is remarkable. It may never be as hot again if we don't strike. And don't try to find what God wants done now. Because what we do now, what you young lay people will do now, will hand on the faith for a hundred years. Yeah. Here's the thing about laity. Everyone thinks, oh, well, laity, what characterises the laity is marriage. Well, Frank Duff wasn't married. Matt Talbot wasn't married. I don't think Carol Lubitsch was married, but maybe she was. I can't remember. Lay person doesn't have to be married, although marriage is typical of the lay state. Marriage is not what is constitutive, defining constitutive aspect of the lay state. Baptism is what brings you into the lay state, Right? Marriage is a specification, it's a further speci sacramental specification of the lay vocation. But a lay person doesn't have to be married. They may choose to enter religious life. If they choose to enter the priesthood, they become a cleric, which is something else. They choose to enter religious life, but they may also join an ecclesial movement. They may decide, um, I think up a state, don't have vows at all. They just renew spiritual contract once a year. That's my understanding, is they, they really have quite radically different understanding of this kind of thing. It's very exciting. You know, because that's the spitting on the hand at the market cross. And I will if you will, and if you don't, I won't. You know, that's, the, I, I love that. That's, that's so radically lay. It's a tremendously lay. Because you've made your commitment, you're, maybe you're a married person as well, or maybe not. But everything else, you shift, you move, you do what's necessary, you move on. Don't be afraid of being a lay Catholic in these convulsed times. Be deeply proud of your vocation as a Catholic. You don't have to be a priest. You don't have to be married. Those are magnificent things to be. You don't have to be a religious. You can just be a lay Catholic. Most lay Catholics marry, and that is fantastic. But if it's not your vocation, fair enough. We'll talk about that because marriage is huge. We'll talk about that another day. I would remind you, do you remember a, a, a series called Yes, Prime Minister? Yeah, there's a great thing in it where the Prime Minister is thinking of returning national service. You know, obligatory military service like they have in France to England, which England used to have. He describes it to Sir Humphrey, the senior civil servant, is describing it to the top army general. And the general who is appalled because, as he says, well, the British army is the best in the world. It's tough. It's, it's professional. It's disciplined. We don't want an army full of yobs peeling potatoes and aldershot. It was just full of ordinary people. And the civil servant replies without showing the slightest change in his expression. You mean like the army that won the last war? <laughs> we tend to forget is that those two great conflicts, the First World War and the Second World War, were entered into by huge mass enthusiasm and that the evil forces in them were defeated by great citizen armies. So the 20th century, whether, you know, for better or worse, the 20th century, it is the age as one historian has described it, is, is the age of the common man. Whatever that is. I've never met a common man. You're saying the 20th century, it's the age of man and woman. It's the age of, of just us. Just us. You know, without any posh and fancy tags on. But that's an incredible adventure. And if that's your vocation, boy, if you have an incredible vocation. You are part of a mighty citizen army the great citizen army, which is the Catholic Church. And of course, straight away, because evil plots and it thickens around every good thing. What came out of it? Communism and fascism. Those perversions of that great movement of ordinary men and women. 
So, to recap, the Vatican Council and von Balthasar, who, by the way, was John Paul's favourite theologian, no passivity, all called to the apostolate. No passivity, no dead weight. This is the age of the kingly commoner, as Melville put it. The kingly commoner from whom all the rulers will come, all the leaders will come, all the saints will come. I told you last day about uh, Carlo Acutis, that young lad who's uh, a computer geek, uh, who's almost certainly now going to be a saint. Gianluca Ferretti was another one. And there are several others. Claire Crockett, the young nun from the home of the mother. This is incredible. These are This is the citizen army. And we priests, we can't be left behind by them. But we're scrambling to try to keep up with them. Jeepers, I, I, I nearly have to have a drink every time I meet with a group of young lay Catholics. Their knowledge of theology, their, their hunger, their, their judgy look they'll give you when you don't know something. You'd be, you'd be sweating. <laughs> you know, this, it's an incredible time. The numbers are small. But the kingly commoners, priests, prophets and kings whom I serve, eh? they're still there. The royal line has not died out. They have the mark on their souls, the ontological mark, the mark forever, the eternal metaphysical mark of baptism on their souls. They are of the tribe and family of the Trinity. They are called to share in the life of the Trinity. And these are the ones whom I have the honour to serve badly. It is an incredible thing to be a Catholic. So much so that I don't know that even the word lay, I, I don't know if it really answers. The Code of Canon Law, the much despised Code of Canon Law, which was the last document of the Vatican Council, it simply refers to Christi Fideles Laici, the Christ believing laity. But it clarifies the thing of the laity, which is too, perhaps, a professional layperson relationship, a bit too much. Okay, the Christi Fideles Laici, the citizen army, the great armed camp that is the Church of God. I'm terrified already. Let the revolution begin. St. Brendan, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.